Biblical encouragement is not saying to your brothers and sisters, you can do this. Biblical encouragement is saying to your brothers and sisters, God has brought you into a place where you can't do this, but I see Him in you. I see God in you. I see Him working in you. I see Him doing this in you. Let's look to Paul's model. And let's say, Lord, we want to be people who pray in proportion to how you show us to pray. We don't neglect the circumstantial needs of others. But nevertheless, we want our prayers to be properly proportionate to what you show us in your word. And how does Paul pray for the church? How does Paul pray for other believers? Well, the ways in which Paul prays for brothers and sisters are legion. They are myriad. And so while it's impossible, unless we took a lot of time, it's impossible for us to completely cover all the ways that Paul prays for the church. Nevertheless, we can make some attempt to maybe see some categories and see some patterns and take that as an example for us and ask the Lord in prayer, Lord, grant, equip, enable me that I might pray for my brothers and sisters like this. So the first thing that Paul takes to the Lord on behalf of others is Paul asks God for a greater, sharper, and more precise spiritual insight on their part. Paul prays that those who are his brothers and sisters, those who are part of this church over here or that church over there, Paul prays, grant them sharper perception, greater insight to your truth, to your reality, greater understanding of your nature. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of to which he has called you. What are the riches of his inglorious inheritance in the saints? In other words, you hear what he's saying. Lord, grant this request. Grant the request that they would have eyes that are sharpened to the glorious blessing of being in Christ, the glorious inheritance that is laid up for them, the glorious reality of having their identity hidden in the identity of Christ. Or two chapters later in Ephesians 3, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. You hear his heart request here. Lord, grant them spiritual vision. Grant them spiritual understanding that they may comprehend the riches of being in Christ. Now, let's take that back and let's plug that back into the woman's prayer. The woman comes before Jesus being under no illusion of what ails her daughter, coming to Jesus forthrightly to say, this is the problem. And then her heart is so burdened and so heavy and she so identifies with her daughter that she says, have mercy on me. Now, to go before the Lord with that prayer for others is hard work. That's not a prayer that comes easy. That's not a prayer that you just spout off. To go before the Lord with a heart that is genuinely burdened for the loved ones in your life and pleading with Him, Lord, it is as if I need to see you more. Let Him see you. Let her see you. And my request is so heartfelt that it is as though I need this. 
That is a spiritually strenuous prayer. Look at another way in which Paul takes loved ones, brothers and sisters, before the Lord. He prays for an increasing spiritual wisdom, which would lead to a life of, of increasing holiness. An increasing spiritual wisdom leading to a life of increasing holiness. Look at his words to the Colossians. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see how Paul connects that together. I pray that their spiritual wisdom, which is a gift from you, would be abundantly given to them to the end that to the result that they would then walk in ways that are pleasing to you, that their lives would be practically holy, that their lives would be holy in a real and tangible way. Grant them spiritual understanding that will be evidenced by outward holiness in their life. Take that prayer before the Lord on behalf of someone else being so burdened that your heart is heavy like this woman's. And you'll see what a strenuous work this type of prayer is. He prays that their spiritual wisdom would increase. He also prays for their increasing and deepening love for one another. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. I pray that you love one another more and with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and, be, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I pray that you who already love each other would love one another more and more, so that in your love for one another, you may approve what is excellent. And approving what is excellent so be pure for the day, pure and blameless for the day of Christ. There's so much there. We could, we could unpack that for the rest of the morning, but there's so much there. He prays that their love for one another would deepen and become richer. He's burdened with a burden like the woman coming before Jesus, just crying out to God, God, it is my heartfelt desire that these Philippians would love each other more. They don't hate each other. You've read the book of Philippians. They don't hate each other. They're having some problems. But it, it is a letter written to a church that is loving and joyful. And yet Paul is so burdened that they would love each other more. He also prays that they would in, increase in, deep, in deepening love for one another to the Thessalonians. From 1 Thess, First Thessalonians chapter 3, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. He also prays, for the granting of spiritual fellowship. This is, as we said earlier, the one request that might border on a request for circumstances because he does pray, Lord, that you would grant that I could go to them and be with them. But I really don't see that as a circumstantial request. I still see that as a spiritual request. He says of the Thessalonians, he says, for with thank what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before God? as we pray most earnestly, most earnestly, night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. You know, we who have all the opportunity to gather together twice a week and even more, and we see brothers and sisters on such a regular basis as we should, as we need to, for us, the need to be with brothers and sisters can become... Muted, dull, it can become black and white instead of the vivid color that Paul sees it. Instead of the sharp, piercing need, Paul sees a deep need to be with these people. He sees a deep need to fellowship with them, to strengthen their faith by fellowship. 
We take that for granted, don't we? Our time of table fellowship before our services, we take that for granted. It's often uh, skipped on and it's often treated as that which is secondary to the life of the church. But Paul saw that as a need so sharp. In his words, earnestly, night and day, I pray that I could come to you and we could fellowship. Romans 1, 9, verses 9 and 10. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may at last succeed in coming to you. You hear the heartfelt need there. Romans, I need to see you. I need to come to you. Pray earnestly that God would grant that I can get there. So these are some of the needs that he prays for. But he also prays a consistent prayer, and that consistent prayer is that their lives, the lives of the ones for whom he prays, would be lives that outwardly bring glory to Christ on the part of those who witness their lives. That those who see you may see you and give God glory and honor to Christ. Look at his prayer to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. Or Romans chapter 15, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. God, I earnestly pray. I earnestly pray with a prayer that burdens my heart in ways that are equivalent to this woman who has the demon-possessed little precious daughter, I pray with such ferventness of prayer that you would create a spirit of unity and harmony among them that is so strong and so prevalent that those who see them would glorify you, that your life would bring glory by the way that they live it. Others that we could see. But then lastly, we want to see just see the, the most consistent thing that Paul prays, and we've seen it in every prayer. Nearly every time he records a prayer, the most consistent thing that he prays is thankfulness. He thanks for the, for the Thessalonians. He thanks God that their faith is growing. Second Thessalonians 1, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Your faith is growing. Your love for one another is growing. And that makes me thankful to see that. Or for the Ephesians, he's thankful that they love the brethren well. Look at chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 again. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Or he is thankful for the Philippians' partnership in the gospel, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Or to the Corinthians, for the Corinthians, he's thankful that they have been gifted for the glory of Jesus Christ. He says, I give thanks for my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way, you were enriched in Him in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful, says Paul, that God has gifted you so richly with spiritual giftings because that is all for the glory of Christ. Or for the Romans, he's thankful that their faith is a means of spreading the gospel there in Rome. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. 
or the Thessalonians. He's thankful that your faith is working and that working faith, that faith that is evidencing itself and works is a steadfast hope for them. He says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering for our God, before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfast of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and many others that we could point to. Paul, above all, would go before God with a heart burdened to thank God deeply and sincerely for the brothers and the sisters of the churches. And as he is thankful for them, he's thankful for all these ways that God is working in them and doing the spiritual labor in their lives. So one of the prayers that we are to pray, and this not for others, but for ourselves, as we pray for ourselves, one of the ways that we should train our souls to pray is this, God, show me how you are working in the lives of my brothers and sisters. Show me. Let me see the work that you're doing. Let me perceive that. Give me eyes to see what you are doing in the lives of my brothers and sisters so that I may thank you for it and so that I may encourage them. Do you know that's what biblical encouragement is? So often we get biblical encouragement wrong. So often we know that we're supposed to encourage one another. But so often we see biblical encouragement as just simply the same thing as worldly encouragement, just with a little Christian language attached to it. Worldly encouragement, the way that the world encourages one another, is not the way the Scriptures teach us to encourage one another. The world encourages one another like this. You can do it. You've got it in you. I know you can do it. You're better than that. You can succeed. That's how the world encourages. So often, Christians will attempt to encourage one another in similar ways, and that encouragement falls far, far short of what biblical encouragement is. Biblical encouragement is not saying to your brothers and sisters, you can do this. Biblical encouragement is saying to your brothers and sisters, God has brought you into a place where you can't do this, but I see Him in you. I see God in you. I see Him working in you. I see Him doing this in you. That is biblical encouragement. To have a brother or sister say to you, I perceive God's work in you doing this. If the Spirit of Christ lives in you, then to hear those words from a brother and sister is infinitely more encouraging than you can do it. Especially when you know deep down you can't. Especially when you know deep down that that what they're seeing as ability is really just you faking it. It's really just an act that you're putting on. Because deep down, that's really what all of us want to do. We want to put on an act to show others that we're capable, that we can do it. And that worldly encouragement comes along to feed the act, to nourish the act. Biblical encouragement comes along and says, put away the act. Because God has brought you to a place, intentionally brought you to a place where you can't do what he's requiring of you. But nevertheless, I see him in you and I see him doing this in you. That is biblical encouragement. But to give that encouragement, we have to have eyes that see it. And that's the prayer to pray for ourselves. Lord, let me see in my brothers and in my sisters what you're doing. Let me see the growth that you're bringing. Let me see the faith that is steadfast. Let me see the witness that's going forth. Let me see the obedience that's increasing. Show that to me so that I can thank you and praise you for that, and so that I can encourage them on to more of the same. So let us be, as Paul showed us so adeptly, and and as this woman showed us so keenly, let us be people that go before our Lord with a similar type of burden. Burden for one another, and not primarily for one another's circumstances but burden for one another's spiritual life. 
Only in that are we truly being the church. Only in praying for one another in that way are we truly living like the New Testament church is to do.